Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about uh, kind of the latest developments in terms of stem cell therapy for Crohn's disease. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this given the ADMIRE trials that have taken place in Europe and now uh, the United States and Canada, but we'll give you the latest updates. So we all know perianal Crohn's disease is very morbid. It affects our patients in terms of pain, quality of life. Patients have drainage, they have relative incontinence, they're on narcotics. It affects about a third of patients with Crohn's, so very prevalent, very common. And unfortunately, it's notoriously difficult to treat. So medical therapy really treats about a third of patients. We can use antibiotics, we can use biologics, but it isn't a long-term solution and it doesn't take care of all of fistulas. We also have local perianal surgeries, whether we do a fistulotomy, a local flap, a lift procedure. We have a various variety of surgical techniques. Again, most of them fraught with complications. There's a risk of incontinence, and long-term healing rates are about 40 to 50%, so not great. For rectovaginal fistulas, we often do bigger operations with flapper operations, like a gracilis flap or a martius flap. Again, a very morbid operation. Patients often have, a, have to have an ostomy for this operation, and this is just to treat a fistula. And then about 20 or 30% of patients will actually end up getting a permanent ostomy, whether it's permanent stoma or with a proctectomy for perianal Crohn's. So we really can do a lot better. We have a lot of room for improvement because what we have currently with our medical and surgical therapy is not particularly effective. So the goals really of healing a fistula are elimination of the tracts, but then also preservation of sphincter function. A lot of these patients will actually have a little bit of baseline incontinence, and we don't want to make that worse with the surgical intervention that we do. So our current therapies are not achieving this. So we really need to think about novel and improved therapies. So that's why there was a lot of excitement when this article came out in 2003. This was a group in Spain, the Garcia Olmo group. They had one patient, a woman that was 33 years old, that had refractory rectovaginal disease. She had uh, been treated with infliximab. She'd had a number of operations. She'd had sepsis, complications from these flaps. After doing a series of animal experiments in the lab, um, they decided to use mesenchymal stem cells. They did a direct injection into the fistula tract, and it was completely healed in three months. So that's pretty exciting when you consider you can just directly inject cells into a very refractory tract and get complete healing. So after that, this is a very busy slide. It's simply to say there have been a lot of trials following those findings. Um, there have been a variety of trials in different countries, different kinds of stem cells used, but basically they're mesenchymal stem cells, most often derived from adipose tissue, um, some from bone marrow. And all these trials have actually shown that these cells are safe and largely effective. And so it sort of has seemed now like this is like a fairy dust that we can just put stem cells on everything with Crohn's. And so I want to talk a little bit about highlight some of the benefits of stem cell therapy, but also some of the limitations with stem cell therapy. So it is partly true that stem cells are like a fairy dust, that this is healing these fistula tracts and healing Crohn's. Uh, we do know that they're safe. So this is the largest trial. This was a phase three trial. Over 200 patients were treated and randomized. And there have been no reported systemic complications or infections. The most frequent adverse event has simply been pain at the injection site, which we would expect and abscess, and these have been the same in the stem cell treatment groups and the control groups. So really nothing that we can see as a signal related to safety with stem cells. Dropout rates have also been very low in clinical trials, and to see a dropout rate of only about 5% in this large of a clinical trial also shows that patients are tolerating this therapy quite well. They're also effective. So this was a trial that we did uh, back when I was at Mayo Clinic. This was a phase one trial using a stem cell coated plug for perianal Crohn's disease, and at six months we had 83% healing. And when we look at the larger trials, the randomized trials, they're also getting 50% healing, so significantly improved compared to their placebo. So stem cells are effective. That's what these clinical trials are showing us. And healing is sustained. This is important because we might treat a fistula with a biologic and we get healing, but when you look at the one-year data, most of those patients will recur. And the same with the local operations that we do, the perianal operations. So this was the one-year data following the injection with stem cell therapy in that large phase three trial, 
And you can see at one year, they still have significant improvement over placebo and that healing rate is sustained if not improved. So that's also very encouraging. The other thing is this is minimally invasive outpatient surgery. So you bring the patient in, you cure at the tract, you clean out the tract, um, you then inject the cells. The important thing is you close the internal opening, you inject the cells just underneath the internal opening and then around the external opening parallel to the tract, and then you're done. Patient goes home. Minimal pain, no phone calls afterward complaining of pain and need for narcotics. This is an easy outpatient operation with no risk of incontinence as compared to the other operations that we do. Same thing with rectovaginal fistula. There's been a couple of trials now looking at mesenchymal stem cells for rectovaginal fistulas, also showing particularly effective with direct injection. Uh, at Mayo, we did a phase one study using that same protocol with stem cells on a plug. We treated five patients, so we harvested adipose tissue, subcutaneous tissue from the abdominal wall. That was sent to the lab. The cells were then impregnated on the plug. This is electron microscopy showing that the cells are alive on that plug, on the gore plug. The patient's then brought to the operating room. We trim the plug to fit the tract, and then trim, trim the plug flush with the vaginal wall, and then that's when we're done. And actually, all five patients had significant response to treatment, with most of them having complete healing. So very promising, very encouraging, and much less invasive than the other options. What about luminal Crohn's disease? So there have been two studies in Asia looking at uh, venous injection of stem cells to treat luminal Crohn's disease. The challenge is when you inject cells into a vein, they get trapped in the lungs. So we come up with a protocol that our plan is to inject stem cells into the ileocolic artery in interventional radiology to treat terminal ileal Crohn's disease. And we're planning on starting this in about a month to two months. So this is just the video highlighting the protocol. So the, the patients, healthy donors, will come and they will either have liposuction to generate adipose tissue or they'll have an adipose tissue biopsy of the subcutaneous tissue. The cells get sent to the lab. Uh, we isolate the mesenchymal stem cells. These get expanded in the laboratory. And then patients with terminal ileal Crohn's disease that would otherwise be going to surgery for a resection are evaluated with enterography and colonoscopy. They're consented for the procedure. They're taken to interventional radiology, and in the interventional radiology suite, the patients receive 30 million mesenchymal stem cells to a direct injection to their ileocolic artery. And the idea is we are hoping that this will reverse the inflammation that is there, and then we would no longer need to operate on the patient. That is the goal. But given that it's a phase one study, this is safety and efficacy, so the secondary endpoint will be um, our safety and feasibility, and the secondary endpoint will be our efficacy. After the de delivery, patients will have an angiogram. They'll be closely monitored for any sign of ischemia because these patients are getting cells to the arteries, so the potential complication is ischemic event. And then they'll be reevaluated at two to four weeks with repeat colonoscopy and enterography. So well, this is great that stem cells are working in these clinical trials and we're expanding the application to luminal disease. There are significant limitations to stem cell therapy. Um, they do have tumorigenic potential. So there are some studies showing that these stem cells will form tumors. We have not seen that in the study with Crohn's disease, but it is a theoretical risk. The other things is they may be immunogenic. So if we have a healthy donor donating mesenchymal stem cells and a recipient receives them, it's possible that they will generate antibodies. We don't think this will be the case because mesenchymal stem cells don't have an MHC class two, which would mean that they're immunoprivileged, but this has not yet been studied in clinical trials, so we're planning on studying that in our upcoming clinical trials. The other thing is that when you produce mesenchymal stem cells for clinical trials, they have to be produced in a good manufacturing practice laboratory. And the infrastructure of this is quite expensive. So it's really not realistic to have a GMP grade site at every hospital or every facility. It's far too expensive. So what ends up happening is that these labs are at particular facilities and then that requires us to deliver cells to other sites so that more patients can be treated. But the challenge is the shelf life of cells is hours, so 48 hours. So that large phase three study being done by Tygenics Takeda the shelf life is 48 hours, so you have to consent the patient, have the patient ready for delivery, be on your operating room schedule, 
have the cells then shipped and they have to be delivered within 48 hours. Patient can't cancel, you can't have any possible hiccups or delays. So that just creates an infrastructure that is difficult to be treating a lot of patients with stem cell therapy. And the other thing is the cost is really prohibitive. It's a huge cost. So right now, the CX601 cell line that's approved in Europe, you have four vials that you receive to treat a fistula, and each vial has about 15 million cells. So you treat the fistula, each vial is 15,000 euros. So it's 60,000 euros to treat a fistula. So it's just a very, very expensive therapy at this point. We don't know if insurance will be covering it, so it, it is prohibitive, the cost. And the other thing is that the efficacy of stem cell therapy, I think, could still be improved. When you look at stem cells from each person, all of us in, in this room, our mesenchymal stem cell is slightly different, and the function of the cell is slightly different. And there hasn't been a lot of studies to date looking at who's the optimal donor, especially for Crohn's disease. So in Crohn's, you may want to find a donor that the stem cells increase T regulatory cells. That would be important for Crohn's disease. In lung disease, there have been studies looking at donors from men and women, and they've seen that women's cells tend to be better for lung disease. And same with age. Age is also important for the function of a mesenchymal stem cell, with young patients being far more effective than older patients. The other thing is we don't know the optimal dose, so studies have ranged from 20 million to 120 million, and we don't have any studies that directly compare different dosages, so we have a lot of room to improve in terms of our dose, and then should we be retreating? We don't have the answers to that yet. The other thing is there's been different modes of delivery of cells. There's been direct injection. There's been some groups, like that group in Spain, that uses to seal and injects cells with to seal. And then our own group at Mayo had used this plug where we put the stem cells on the plug. And we don't really know the best mode of delivery. There are many groups now working on different scaffolding materials that the cells like and will adhere to and will rapidly dissolve. So there is a lot of bioengineering going on and work being done in that space. So what are the other options? So what we're working on in the laboratory is that, if you can see here, this is a cartoon where this is the entire mesenchymal stem cell. And cells kind of deliver these, eggs, these little blebs that are uh, lipid-bound membranes, but they carry microRNA, RNA, protein, and cytokines, and they're called extracellular vesicles. And the idea is, is these, these little extracellular vesicles actually carry the function of the whole cell. And what's great about this is extracellular vesicles, there's a few things, is they're not, they don't have the same tumor potential, their shelf life is six months at room air when they're put into a certain formulation, and the cost is quite low. So the cost of manufacturing of these extracellular vesicles is $10 a dose versus 60,000. So you can imagine if we have something that's stable on room temperature that we can transport and that costs $10, if it has the same efficacy as a mesenchymal stem cell, that's very promising to treating a lot more patients. So that's what we're working on currently in the lab. So in conclusion, um, regenerative-based approaches really may prove superior to conventional therapy. I think we have, still have some room to go, but in terms of the phase three trials that have been done, it looks as though it is superior in terms of efficacy. And I think that future research will really determine the optimal donor for these cells. We haven't yet reached those conclusions in terms of research. There are significant limitations, the large one really being cost and then the manufacturing at these specific sites. So I think that there's alternatives that we're looking into, like these extracellular vesicles, which may overcome some of these limitations with stem cell therapy. Thank you.